I'm really suffering right now in what God is uh, fulfilling and how he's crushing me. And so what he has me, what he's talking to me about where he's leading me is with regard to the Israelites. A lot of times we look at the Israelites story and we see that, you know, God parted the sea and he brought them out of Egypt and he did all of these things. And because we know the end of the story, in part, we look at their story and we think, oh my goodness, they were so foolish. Why were they grumbling in the wilderness? They're grumbling about not having water. They're grumbling about not having, having food. They're wanting to turn back to Egypt. There we sat around pots of meat. But we forget the things that God has done in our lives. And when it comes time for us to really suffer and endure in our faith, we look back and we think, well, that could have been because of this, like, or we start to minimize what it was that he did, or we start to forget what he's told us and promised and everything else. Yeah, I mean, he's really pushed me in my faith beyond any place that I thought I could ever go. And I, I don't really want to share all the details of what he's doing. I'm just suffering. To be honest, I don't even have the energy to share those details. And the only thing I want to do with the energy that I do have is to keep leaning into faith. Keep trusting and looking at what are the examples he's given me in scripture and try to remember the things he's done and the things that he said. So even though we're entering into Passover, what I'm looking at is not so much the first Passover, but actually the, what would it be, the 40th Passover that the Israelites observed in which he brought them into the promised land. 40th to the day. And during the first Passover, he parted the Red Sea and led them on dry land this 40th Passover, he dried up the Jordan, which was full during, you know, at its flood stage. He dries it up so that they can cross over on dry land. He does the same exact miracle that he did originally when he brought them out of Egypt. Not only demonstrating his glory, but connecting with them. Like, that's definitely, you know, when you're in a relationship with someone and you're remembering, like, when they wooed you to them or when you wooed one another to each other. And they do something that is reminiscent of that time and what was going on during that relationship. It's really special. And so you can see that tender heart of God to remind them of who he is in relation to them and of his great love for his firstborn. So I really appreciate those details. I just, they're really, it's so beautiful. The fact that he brought them into the promised land to the day during Passover parted the sea in the first one, dried up the land, is keeping his promises. It's just so incredible. And I was also thinking how they must have wondered because, you know, God said that he was going to bring them into a land flowing with milk and honey, a land in which they would reap where they had not sown. He made certain promises to them and he's made certain promises to us. And I'm in a situation right now where I'm like, how are you going to do this? How are you going to do this? And then I start going, you know, I start getting kind of freaked out by the things that, you know, man is doing or man is capable of. And I start putting limitations and I have to like redirect myself back to what he's done in the word. Like that's a pretty big promise to make. You're going to go into the into this land and you're going to reap where you have not sown. I'm going to give you all of this. Where you, you haven't dug trenches, you didn't, you know, you didn't do any of this, but you're going to reap from it. It's not like God's people are, are like some strong, barbaric people who everyone fears. It's not like that. And I want you to listen to the way that they took down this town. It's just not the things of the world. So I'm starting in Joshua 5. Now when all the Amorite kings of the west of the Jordan and all the Canaanite kings along the coast heard how the Lord had dried up the Jordan before the Israelites until they had crossed over, their hearts melted in fear and they no longer had the courage to face the Israelites. At that time, the Lord said to Joshua, make flint knives and circumcise the Israelites again. So Joshua made flint knives and circumcised the Israelites at Gibeah Haraloth. Now this is why he did so. All those who came out of Egypt, all the men of military age, died in the wilderness on the way after leaving Egypt. All the people that came out had been circumcised, but all the people born in the wilderness during the journey from Egypt had not. The Israelites had moved about in the wilderness 40 years until all the men who were of military age when they left Egypt had died, since they had not obeyed the Lord. For the Lord had sworn to them that they would not see the land he had solemnly promised their ancestors to give us, a land flowing with milk and honey. So he raised up their sons in their place, 
and these were the ones Joshua circumcised. I mean, it's kind of the same with us, right? Like our, our ancestors didn't return to him. My mom and dad, as much as, you know, I do believe that my mom had a love for the Lord. I'm not so sure about my dad, but I believe that my mom had a love, whatever that, however you define that. They didn't fully return. They did not bear the fruit of ones who had fully returned. And so you see what happens. He raises up sons in their place. You don't want it, I'll extend it to the next generation, you know? And if they don't want it, I'll extend it to the next generation. And you guys have seen that with your own parents and your own families. So he raised up sons in their place, and these were the ones Joshua circumcised. They were still uncircumcised because they had not been circumcised on the way. And after the whole nation had been circumcised, they remained where they were in camp until they were healed. Then the Lord said to Joshua, Today I've rolled away the reproach of Egypt from you. So the place has been called Gilgal to this day. And Gilgal sounds like the Hebrew for roll. On the evening of the 14th day of the month, while camped at Gilgal on the plains of Jericho, the Israelites celebrated the Passover. So that's kind of interesting, right? I mean, God is doing this intentionally, circumcision and Passover. And this just is not ever talked about in counterfeit Christianity. Jesus extended the covenant on Passover. There is a clear connection between Passover and the covenant. There is a clear connection between what circumcision means and circumcision as a covenant that was given to Abraham and what it means about whether or not you're one of his uh, today. So Paul explained that external circumcision is nothing. It's actually the internal circumcision that matters, circumcision of the heart from the sinful flesh. But physical circumcision was established in order for us to understand what it means to be cut off or to cut off something that does not belong. And sinful flesh needs to be cut off. You need to be cut off from it in your heart. This is the reason it was established. And so this is the covenant. And Paul talks about, he specifically says that a Jew is not one who is externally circumcised, but is one who is circumcised in heart. And so a Jew is defined as one who is in the covenant. You understand? Because circumcision always was a, the covenant. It always represented a covenant that God made with Abraham and made with his pe with Abraham's children who are God's people, right? So Abraham was not just told, go circumcise yourself. He was told, go circumcise yourself and your household and all your slaves. And so Abraham was including all of these people in the covenant. He wasn't just worried about himself like a lot of people today. In fact, it's impossible for you to be in the covenant if you are just worried about yourself or your own household. You have to be concerned about Christ's body or you can't say that you're concerned about Christ. That's lunacy. And so as time went on and God gave in certain instructions to Moses, which are not limited to the Ten Commandments, but are partially described in the Ten Commandments, that covenant increased and we became more and more aware of what God requires of us. Okay, if you don't believe that, well, where does where is sacrifice in the Ten Commandments? There's a whole lot more that goes into God's covenant than just the Ten Commandments. People like to focus on that because it's, oh, it's just ten. I can handle ten rules. Well, guess what? You need to obey everything that God's Spirit moves you to do because he, he writes his law on the tablets of your heart and mind. And yes, I said the L word. Oh, my goodness. You know what Jesus said about the L word? He said... Not one jot or tittle, not the least stroke of a pen is going to disappear from it. He said, I have not come to abolish the law. I've come to fulfill it. So there's, not, there's no equating abolishment and fulfillment, which is the way that counterfeit Christianity seems to be defining God's covenant. There's an abolishment of what he has established, and that completely goes against what Jesus said. The other thing that I'm aware of is that Paul also says that those, not all who are descended from Abraham are Abraham's children. So this huge emphasis on ethnicity or some ethnic nation, God established a nation set apart from other nations in order to help you to understand when you're scattered among those nations, how you need to live. That you, even though you live among them, that you live separate from them. That you separate yourself from these other nations. So it's truly absurd for anybody in counterfeit Christianity to be looking at some land in the Middle East 
a people in the Middle East and saying, those are God's people. You don't know your word. If that is what you're doing, you don't know your word. So in verse 10, it says, On the evening of the 14th day of the month, while camped at Gilgal on the plains of Jericho, the Israelites celebrated the Passover. The day after the Passover, that very day, they ate some of the produce of the land, unleavened bread and roasted grain. The manna stopped the day after they ate this food from the land. There was no longer any manna for the Israelites, but that year they ate the produce of Canaan. Okay, now I want to just point something out that I pointed out in another video. The day after the Passover, if they're referring to... Um, you know, the first day of the Passover on the 14th, uh, the next day is a Sabbath. So on Sabbath, you wouldn't be harvesting and you wouldn't be waving that grain. So that can't be the wave sheaf day or the offering of first fruits. So what this is referring to is actually the 22nd day of the month because the 21st day would have been the seventh day in which you were observing a Sabbath. So the 22nd Second day will always be the offering of first fruits in that particular month. So that's going to correlate to either March or April or March, end of April, early March. Now, how do we know that it's going to correlate that way? Because there's no April or March, but there are seasons that go according to the that that are according to the Gregorian calendar. And so we can look at that and we can say, okay, this is going to be either this is going to always going to be on the twenty second of God's calendar, but it's going to correlate to, oh my goodness, I think I've been seeing the end of April, early March. You, you know, I've, I've flipped that. I reversed it. So end of March, early April is what I mean. So if during that particular year, it is being observed in reference to the Passover, it'll land on the 22nd. But if it is simply in reference to the Sabbath, because remember that Passover is not going to be on the same in the same season every year, then you still follow the instruction that is given in Leviticus 23. And in that case, then the, the, Sabbath, the day after the Sabbath is going to be the 23rd. I hope that makes sense. If I've confused you, please let me know and I'll, I'll clear it up. Let me just repeat it again. If during that particular season, you have the Passover and Festival of Unleavened Bread, it's going to come at the day after the last day of the Passover. Now, in that particular month, it's going to throw off the seven-day Sabbaths because the 21st is actually a Sabbath. And so if with the 21st being a Sabbath, you won't have the 29th being a Sabbath as you normally it would in a normal month. It's going to be the 28th because it set, it set the, the seven-day Sabbaths back by one day. So... The word does not t actually tell you, well, this is how it's going to, you know, it's going to be on this particular date. The word says the day after the Sabbath. So I just want to make that clear. So if during that particular season, Passover is not correlating, then you would just go by the regular Sabbaths and you would end up on the starting on the 23rd, doing your count from the 23rd down to, uh, down to uh, Pentecost. It's not going to really affect anything because one day is not going to affect that sequence of weeks. The only thing that it would affect is it would we would be looking at the first week as occurring a day earlier and ending a day earlier, and that would be the first week. But New Moon is going to reset those weeks, so it's not really going to affect when Pentecost occurs. So any previous videos where we've counted this down, don't worry, it's not going to affect that. And also, for those of you who have the calendar of our meeting dates, it's not going to affect those dates because uh, none of these dates, the last time that um, the unleavened bread was set in reference to the offering of first fruits was in 2022. So we've actually, um, offering of first fruits is not occurring right after the festival of unleavened bread. Well, not directly after, like that's not the last Sabbath. Okay, the point of this, the point of what I'm saying is that we know exactly when the fest, the offering of first fruits would occur. We know the season in which it would occur, and we know the season in which the wheat harvest would occur. And the reason this has been such an argument is because you can't find any consistent information online if you look up wheat. And wheat and barley have been altered. As much as they've been, you know, altering this food, we have a different or a difference in seasons coming up or harvesting dates. But we know from the word where this was set in reference to.
Why do we know that? Because I demonstrated for you in a previous video, the first Passover would have been set in reference to the, the lamb, the birthing of the lambs, which happens in February and March. And 40 years later, you would have ended up in that season again. And in 2022, we ended up in that season again. And when Jesus was here, we ended up in that season again. So scripture confirms it. Now, the reason we know that the date-specific holy days are not actually season-specific, they're not always going to be in the same season for a few reasons. Well, on a season-specific calendar, which is what Jews prostituted themselves to or or reformed Jews, they adapted God's calendar in order to accommodate the Gregorian calendar. Is that ever a good idea to adapt what God has established to the world? Not really. We know that that's incorrect. We know that it doesn't line up with scripture. And we know that on that particular calendar, they're claiming that these are fall holy days. Uh, those that start in the month of Ethanim, which they call Tishrei, which is a Babylonian name. It's called Ethanim in the Bible. Those holy days do not correlate with seasons. There are only two season-specific holy days, and that's the offering of first fruits and the festival of weeks. So on God's 360-day calendar, which equates to 354 days on the calendar we've been using, you're going to end up 11, day, 11 days earlier every single year. And eventually, you're going to make your trip all around the seasons. And we see that that was true because Paul was the day, you know, uh, right after the Day of Atonement, he was sailing and was trying to find a place to winter in. Last I checked, fall and winter are not, in, are not the same season. We also know that the calendar had been established in Genesis because God is referencing these months. But then after 430 years of the Israelites being in Egyptian captivity, his calendar had been lost. And so he reset it just like he's doing with us, just like his calendar has been lost. And so he's resetting it with us. So what he did was he told Moses, this is going to be your first month, the first month of your year. Now, if that had been a seasonal thing, the Israelites would have been able to get right back on track. No big deal. But God needed to let them know that this was going to be the first month of their year. Look in Genesis. You can see that God had already established his calendar. He had to restore it with the Israelites because it had been lost. Same thing with us. Isn't that metaphor? The analogy is so profound. We've been in captivity for all these years. The calendar has been lost and now he's resetting it and restoring it with us as he has brought us out of Egypt. We also know in scripture that the word talks about the spring when the kings go off to war. But three different places in scripture, we're told that Nebuchadnezzar laid siege to Jerusalem, captured the Israelites, captured the Jews on the 10th of the 10th month. So on a seasonal calendar, we would look at that and go, well, that's in winter time or fall at best. But see, not on God's calendar, because that 10th month is making its trip all through the seasonal calendar. Okay, so we see this here in verse 11, that the day after the Passover, that very day, so what they're saying, what they're referring to as the Passover is the entire Passover, that whole eight days, the seven days of the unleavened bread and the first day in which the lamb was slaughtered. The day after the Passover on the 22nd, that very day, they ate some of the produce of the land. And the reason we know that is because they were not allowed to eat the produce of the land or any roasted grain until they had brought the... Uh, sheaf wave offering for the offering of first fruits. And we're told that they had to do that the day after the Sabbath. Prior to that, they'd been eating the manna. Okay. So it says the manna stopped the day after they ate this food from the land and there was no longer any manna for the Israelites. But that year they actually ate the produce of Canaan. God is so specific. He's so exact. And he wants us to know when, how to establish these things, but I'm telling you, you can't know until he lets you know. So it's really exhilarating that he would choose our generation to reveal this too. It's incredible. Now, when Joshua was near Jericho, he looked up and saw a man standing in front of him with drawn sword in his hand. Joshua went up to him and asked, are you for us or for our enemies? Neither, he replied, but as commander of the army of the Lord, I have now come. Then Joshua fell face down to the ground in reverence and asked him, what message does my Lord have for his servant? The commander of the Lord's army replied, 
take off your sandals for the place you're standing is you, the place where you are standing is holy. And Joshua did so. Now, is that similar to what he did with Moses as well? Can you imagine get, going into the land and a servant of the Lord's army, a commander of the Lord's army is greeting you there and telling you, take off your sandals. The place you're, you're standing is holy. Now the gates of Jericho were securely barred because of the Israelites. No one went out, no one came in. Then the Lord said to Joshua, see, I've delivered Jericho into your hands along with its king and its fighting men. March around the city once with all the armed men. Do this for six days. Have seven priests carry trumpets of ram's horns in the front of the ark. On the seventh day, march around the city seven times with the priests blowing the trumpets. When you hear them sound a long blast on the trumpets, have the whole army give a loud shout. Then the wall of the city will collapse and the army will go up, everyone straight in. I mean, that's kind of weird, right? Like that's such a, a weird way to fight a war or a battle and capture a city. You really have to believe that God is with you and that he's going to do these things in the way that he does them. And see, you know, not that long ago, I, I posted a video about why I believe the, the Apocrypha is false and the book of the Maccabees, which I once, I once did not consider, I never considered it to be scripture, but I did consider it to be a historical account. But there was a part of the Maccabees that really didn't set right with me. And that was the fact that it's written that the first time that the Israelites were attacked, it was on a Sabbath and all of them died. And then the second, the next Sabbath, they were like, well, we're not going to let that happen again. But see, in the word, it doesn't talk like that. The word does not talk like that. The word tells us that people return to God and they ask him, what do you want us to do? And he can do whatever he wants. He can pe keep his people safe. He's able to deliver them. He's also able to say, this is what I want you to do on that day. So someone sent me a message the other day to ask me, well, what day was the, was the Sabbath here when they were marching? Because they marched for six days. And then on the seventh day, they marched seven times around the city. It doesn't matter because the word tells us that God's people are not desecrating the Sabbath when they're serving in his temple. In the same way, if God tells you, this is what you are to do, but that's not what was written in the book of the Maccabees. What was written in the book of the Maccabees is that they made a unilateral decision. They didn't return to God and ask him what they should do. There is a clear difference between the word and the apocrypha. And so all of a sudden, people are having all this like, oh my goodness, now we're receiving answers in the Apocrypha for information that was missing in God's word. Okay, so God has provided us an incomplete word. He didn't know how to account for these things. And suddenly, additions to the scroll have shown up, and they're giving us the information that we need to know. I don't think so. Especially when they don't follow the pattern or the heart of God. I don't think so. I'm not buying it, and I will not believe it. So listen to how God brings victory to the Israelites, gives them what he has promised, a land flowing with milk and honey, a land in which they didn't dig trenches, they didn't sow or work the land. He's just handed this over to them. So Joshua, son of Nun, called the priests and said to them, take up the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord and have seven priests carry, the trum carry trumpets in front of it. And he ordered the army advance, march around the city with an armed guard going ahead of the Ark of the Lord. When Joshua had spoken to the people, the seven priests carrying the seven trumpets before the Lord went forward, blowing their trumpets, and the Ark of the Lord's Covenant followed them. The armed guard marched ahead of the priests who blew the trumpets, and the rear guard followed the Ark. All this time the trumpets were sounding, but Joshua had commanded the army, do not give a war cry, do not raise your voices, do not say a word until the day I tell you to shout, then shout. So he had the Ark of the of the Lord carried around the city, circling it once. Then the army returned to the camp and spent the night there. There. So what does the Ark of the Lord represent, by the way? This represents the presence of God. In, in the Ark of the Covenant, Ark of the Lord was the presence of God. In, and it was kept in the Holy of Holies, in the tabernacle, or in the temple. This is why, by the way, people would spread their hands out to heaven or towards the temple. They would pray towards the temple, okay? Because... You didn't have the Holy Spirit inside of you. And so to be spreading your hands out into the air somewhere now does not make sense. This is irreligious superficiality. 
God's spirit is inside of you. Where are you spreading your hands to? God isn't flesh and he doesn't dwell in temples made by human hands, okay? So when you pray, you're praying to his spirit who is with you. He's with you. When Paul says lifting up holy hands, I want everyone to pray lifting up holy hands without arguing or quarreling. Like, do, does, I don't understand what people do with that. Do they just eliminate the context of that sentence? Lifting up holy hands, but your holy hands represent holy deeds without quarreling or conflict. It'd be a little weird if he said, I want you to pray with your hands raised without quarreling or conflict. He's telling you, this is what you do with your hands, not quarrel, not fight each other. This is what you do with your deeds. So what is this representing here? What this is representing that they are carrying the ark of the Lord is that the Lord is with them as they're marching. That's incredible. It's such an incredible um, understanding for us to have today. And I think that we often take that for granted that he says, when you go through the waters, when you go through the furnace, I'm going to be with you. I'll go ahead of you and I'll fight for you. And here they had a physical representation. Do you think it was easier for them because they had a physical representation? I mean, they still had to believe that their God in this ark is fighting for them. That's no more easier than it is for you to believe that God in your heart is fighting for you, that God in your heart is with you. Joshua got up early the next morning and the priest took up the ark of the Lord. The seven priests carrying the seven trumpets went forward marching before the ark of the Lord and blowing the trumpets. The armed men went ahead of them, and the rear guard followed the ark of the Lord while the trumpets kept sounding. So on the second day, they marched around the city once and returned to the camp. They did this for six days. On the seventh day, they got up at daybreak and marched around the city seven times in the same manner, except that on that day, they encircled the city seven times. The seventh time around, when the priest shout sounded the trumpet blast, Joshua commanded the army, shout, for the Lord has given you the city. The city and all that is in it are to be devoted to the Lord. Only Rahab the prostitute and all who are with her in, the, in her house shall be spared because she hid the spies we sent. But keep away from the devoted things so that you will not bring about your own destruction by taking any of them. Otherwise, you will make the camp of Israel liable to destruction and bring trouble on it. All the silver and gold and the articles of bronze and iron are sacred to the Lord and must go into his treasury. When the trumpet sounded, the army shouted, and, all, and at the sound of the trumpet, when the men gave a loud shout, the wall collapsed. So everyone charged straight in, and they took the city. They devoted the city to the Lord, and destroyed with the sword every living thing in it, men and women, young and old, cattle, sheep, and donkeys. Joshua said to the two men who had spied out the land, go into the prostitute's house and bring her out, and all who belong to her in accordance with her oath, with your oath to her. So the young men who had done the spying went in and brought out Rahab, her father and mother, her brothers and sisters, and all who belonged to her. They brought out her entire family and put them in a place outside the camp of Israel. Then they burned the whole city and everything in it, but they put the silver and gold and the articles of bronze and iron into the treasury of the Lord's house. But Joshua spared Rahab the prostitute with her family and all who belonged to her, because she hid the men Joshua had sent as spies to Jericho, and she lives among the Israelites to this day. At that time, Joshua pronounced this solemn oath, Cursed before the Lord is the one who undertakes to rebuild this city, Jericho. At the cost of his firstborn son, he will lay its foundations. At the cost of his youngest, he will set up its gates. So the Lord was with Joshua, and his fame spread throughout the land. I just thought that was a really beautiful story of... What God actually promises to do in the end when we've fully come out of Egypt, right? Like, I mean, we've been brought out of Egypt. There's an, an aspect of that when we have been brought out of bondage and he has redeemed us, but we're still working on our covenant. So we haven't fully been like we haven't been saved yet. It's ridiculous for anyone to say that they've been saved because what are you still doing here? You're working out your salvation. That's what the word says. So when Paul is saying you've been sa you're, you're saved, he also says you're saved if. So God has predestined those for salvation and those for wrath. So when you come out of the womb, are you saved? Well, God has either predestined you for it or not, 
but it doesn't mean you're saved. The only way that you know that you're saved is if you're bearing the fruit of working out your salvation, of working out your covenant. This is the reason why Peter tells us we're working out our covenant. This is the reason why Paul says you are saved if otherwise you have believed in vain. The whole word matters, guys, not just little snippets here and there in order to create a picture. The word will create its own picture. It does not need you to fill in the gaps with your own stories so or with counterfeit Christianity stories. The word is going to tell you everything you need to know. And so what the word says is that when Israel is saved, now they're going to go through the Antichrist reign. They're going to go through that 45 days between the 1290th day and the 1335th day in Daniel 12. They're going to go through that period of time, which is a time that Jesus said in Matthew is worse than has ever, that this world has ever seen. So there is no pre-tribulation rapture. That's ridiculous. And then the resurrection will take place in those days. We don't know the day or hour, but we do know a number of days. We don't know the day or the hour, but we know within a range of days. We at least know what needs to happen before that resurrection takes place. And so to, t to say that that's going to happen before tribulation is, I, I don't even know, the, the, whoever's saying that cannot possibly be reading the word, the entire word. After the resurrection takes place and God's people are saved, they are going to plunder. And we're told that Babylon is going to give over all its wealth to God's people. Everything belongs to God. We've been told that throughout the Bible. So how could that possibly belong to Babylon? It belongs to God. And he'll do with it what he wants to do with it. So they're acquiring wealth for God's people. Everything they have will be given to one who has more, right? That's what the, that's the parable of the wicked and lazy servant, isn't it? And we will go into a land flowing with milk and honey, a land in which we have not sown, so, but we will be the ones to reap. Everything will belong to God's people. The beast will go into the lake of burning sulfur. False prophet will go into the lake of burning sulfur. The devil will be bound for a thousand years, and then he'll go back out to deceive, uh, to deceive in the four corners of the earth. And the people who go up in the second resurrection will be given a chance to be saved only as one escaping the flames. So even of those who are being saved only as one escaping the flames, they have no inheritance no reward. What do you think God's going to do with the the outright wicked if that's how he's treating this particular remnant? I mean, come on. It's very clear in Ezekiel 46 that there is a distinction between the sons of God and the servants of God. The sons of God have an inheritance that is to be theirs. They're not, it's never to be taken from them. Those who go up in the second resurrection who are saved only as one escaping the flames, will not receive a reward, will not receive an inheritance. So the beast, I mean, those in counterfeit Christianity who are the beast of the beast, they have identified themselves as being of the beast with that mark that's in their hearts. They have nothing coming to them. The word says the smoke of their torment will rise forever and ever. They won't, will not be given a second chance. Everything that they have stolen from us, we will be given so much more. I hope this message encourages you, and I hope that you will discern it with God.